everyone. Uh, well, those are two pretty good talks you can have to follow, but I'll see if I can pull it off. My name's Joel Griffith. Uh, I'm going to tell you about a hobby maker project that I think uh, there's a good chance some people here would be interested in uh, doing, since it involves a nice intersection of uh, programming and tinkering and general science geekery. Uh, and that project is building a true random number generator using a uh, desktop cosmic ray detector. So I'm a programmer and a system administrator. I work for a science education research program called QuarkNet. Uh, one big part of my job as a system administrator is lecturing my coworkers about using a password manager. <laughs> uh, hopefully everyone here has, and I'm going to give you that lecture. But one of the big reasons we want to use password managers is that they can create and remember long, random passwords that are virtually unguessable. But wait, you might be thinking, computers are fully deterministic physical systems. Uh, how can a program generate something that's generally unpredictable? Uh, and you're right, uh, that is a problem, and probably most of us here are at least a little bit familiar with that issue. Uh, the usual approach is to take a little bit of mostly random events from user interactions and maybe network events uh, and to use that seed as a seed entropy for an input to a, a, a cryptographically secure pseudo-random number generator program uh, that then uh, outputs its uh, results to a uh, sort of a storage unit of entropy that the operating system maintains. So for Linux, that is dev random. And uh, that's not perfectly scientifically random, but hopefully it's random enough uh, that that entropy is impossible to guess for the lifetime of whatever it is you're using this for, whatever it cryptographic keys and whatever you have in mind. Uh, but if you do need true randomness, like for really good security, uh, you, do, you cannot get that from software. Uh, you do have to turn to some form of hardware that uses a genuinely random physical process uh, to produce random numbers. Uh, some examples I've got listed here are uh, radioactive sources, uh, the, the decay of radioactive sources <coughs> is truly and purely random. Uh, you can use circuits uh, made out of Zener diodes that harness thermal randomness from a circuit. Uh, and you can even point a camera at a wall of lava lamps. Uh, this is something if anyone here, uh, anyone who's on the Hat Greenville uh, Slack, uh, Eric, a few, uh, few plus last week posted a YouTube video about Cloudflare. They, they use this method. They have a wall of lava lamps that they use to process for random data for their cryptographic keys. Uh, and we'll see if we can add cosmic rays to that list, maybe. Uh, so if you're not familiar with cosmic rays, these are basically random physical events that just fall out of the sky onto us. So what could be easier than trying to harness that? <laughs> uh, the Earth is continuously bombarded by high energy particles from outer space. Uh, these impact in the upper atmosphere and they generate showers of particles that we can measure. Uh, if you want a general idea of how often this happens, every time you see the light on this box flash, that's one cosmic ray passing through this volume. So pretty much constantly. There's no shortage of source for this data. So this, uh, this item here, this object, is called a, it's a cosmic watch. Uh, it's a cosmic ray detector. Uh, it's an open source hardware and software project. Uh, it originated in, uh, in, at MIT about 2016 uh, by a couple of folks, uh, Spencer Aksani and Katarina Frankowitz and a few others. So I've drawn you a, a, a quick cartoon here of what's going on inside this box. Now, so the bulk of the detector is a uh, piece of scintillator. This is a clear plastic material. The cosmic ray flies through it. It emits light. That light gets uh, absorbed by a, a silicon photomultiplier, or a SIGM. Uh, that converts it to an electrical current. Uh, the spec for the cosmic watch includes a file for a printed, co uh, printed circuit board and a shopping list for all the components you need to make this in your workshop. Uh, and then this, the circuitry does the hardware signal processing. And this is all hooked into an Arduino Nano 
for software signal processing and data output. Uh, here's what the inside of this looks like without the case after you have everything put together. Uh, that scintillator I talked about, that's what's right here, that's wrapped up in plastic to prevent light from getting in and getting you noise from your signal. That's your multiple noise. Well, <laughs> actually that's true. So in this case, for a random number generator, you're right, we may not even need to bother with that step. Typically, this, these are put to other uses, which uh, actually is a good segue, thank you. Uh, I'll take a brief detour from the random number generation, just to, to pitch a few benefits of uh, the Cosmic Watch as a hobby item. Uh, it's a great way to learn and practice a variety of maker skills, uh, fabrication skills, especially with circuitry, soldering. Uh, the scintillator needs to be cut, polished, heated, drilled, uh, all kinds of things. It's things you can do, certainly at a regular workbench, but it's, um, it's a good exercise. You also get to learn how Arduinos work, uh, how to work with the Arduino IDE. And in understanding how these work, you learn a little bit about physics and uh, scientific data. And then there's all kinds of projects you can do with them once you have it assembled. You can, uh, everyone remember the past week, all the talk about the Northern Lights, the Aurora. Uh, we saw the Northern Lights here. Because of a coronal mass ejection, uh, a solar flare, those show up on the cosmic watches because it's, it's the same basic physical process generates uh, the Aurora as generates cosmic rays. And you can do kinds of, all kinds of fun experiments. You can test you know, the directions of cosmic rays, the, the flux there, uh, how weather influences it, which it does, how it changes in altitude, and so on. Uh, or if you want, you can just think of whatever fun you can have with a constant source of good quality scientific data sitting on your desktop waiting for you to do who knows what with. So if you have or know or are maybe a high school student or a college student who is looking for a good, a fun computer science or a science project, or if you just you know, like crypt cryptography, if you just like science, any of those things, it's, uh, there's a lot of, uh, lot of benefit to this. Uh, the reason I'm bringing all this up in front of a crowd is that uh, if anyone is interested in pursuing the Cosmic Watch as a hobby project, I encourage you to find and join, force, join forces with other people, uh, it's particularly because the uh, cost per unit of all of the materials that goes into the Cosmic Watch, that drops off really noticeably once you get uh, to a certain uh, quantity of order. Uh, so unless you personally would like 100 different units, uh, if you'd like any of these, uh, and joining forces and going in together with a bunch of other people, that uh, is the way to go. So I, Wanted to introduce that to everyone. This, this seemed like a target-rich environment for people who might like this kind of thing. Uh, but what I've uh, described for you so far, uh, getting back to random numbers, I call this step one because there's still some work to do to see if this is feasible, if this is going to work. Uh, <clears throat> so I do, I do have the first step done. I have cosmic watches. These were assembled by some folks that I work with. Uh, I actually did not get the joy of assembling these myself. They took that away from me and went ahead and uh, put them all together for me. All right. Uh, but so the next steps would be to, uh, to streamline the data taking. Uh, so th there's a lot of overhead in the normal, the default data taking uh, software here. I think I can get that reduced, get that down to something that could be just a good, you know, a, a low level stream of constant data without putting too much load on the CPU. And then once I've done that, of course, I'm going to find the actual randomization algorithm. Uh, so the cosmic ray strikes themselves are random, but how do we pull a good stream of ones and zeros that's perfectly random out of that? Uh, we'll investigate that and then test it. Make sure that this is actually random. There's a, a plethora of data testing suites for this, so that'll be fun to, to get into all of those. And uh, then eventually, of course, we want to test uh, everything else. Test uh, the output of one cosmic watch against another. Make sure there aren't any correlations. Correlations are non-random. That ruins your entropy. You don't want those. Uh, and uh, I, finally, what I'd really like to do is to build a Zener diode circuit that accomplishes the same thing uh, using only diodes. And just to see, just to compare the two, you know, does one have a better uh, power draw, better entropy output, better 
things like that. So uh, this is a sample of the default data output of the constant watch. Uh, I realize that it's probably pretty small if anyone wants to come up and take a closer look if you have any questions about it. But uh, the big thing here is going to be these timestamp numbers. Those are going to be the source of the randomness for this because those are what we expect to be random. But that's the idea. A, random, a hardware random number generator from a cosmic ray detector. Anyone have any questions about that? So you just want yeah. timestamps? Timestamps are the, probably the most obvious source of randomness. You could also do, you can't, again, I apologize, you can't quite see this, but some of this other data is uh, reflects maybe the energy of the ray that comes through. Uh, you can get that off of the, uh, it's the analog to digital converter inside. Uh, you can pull that number. So that's probably pretty random. I don't know for sure, but that's another. Another thing you could look at. Yes. So are these gamma rays? These are. So these are actually muons. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. To show these, but uh, yeah. So gamma rays are produced in the same processes. Uh, they just don't register in these. So there are some. But what's happening here is yeah, we have the original cosmic ray. It comes in and blurts out a uh, huge shower of particles. The ones that make it down to our level here are muons. So these are uh, particles that are very similar to electrons, if you remember from you know, high school or college physics, except that they're, they're just much heavier. And uh, is that the answer? Yeah, yeah. Um, I was just kind of curious like, what tools you use like, to test the randomness, like make sure it's actually like, better than a super random generator. Like, what do you do to test the randomness? Yeah, that's uh, one of the things I'm going to explore different ways. But uh, the, one of the, the more common suites of testing that I found uh, was uh, there's this, uh, a set of tests called uh, Die Hard, and then somebody had made improvements on the Die Hard suite. So of course, if you make improvements on Die Hard, you have to call that Die Hard Two, Die Harder. <laughs> <laughs> that exists. It's a real thing. So I'm going to start with that. But it's, not, it's Die Harder. It's just, uh, I'm going to start with that and then see where see where that takes me. Okay. Eric, now do you just use that data coming off there for all your randomness? Or is that just still a seed for a pseudo random number generator? Like, does it generate a volume enough of random data? That's a really good question. Uh, I, I think the, the total volume that's going to be produced is probably pretty low. Yeah. That's one of the things I want to try to find out. Uh, but yeah, even if it, even if you can't use that for all of your entropy, you could get use it as a seed. Certainly, uh, that's why you make one. So you got all for <laughs> <you can laughs> exactly. So I'm going to go to the back. I think you've had you had your hand up. So. Um, Say if you have two of those units right next to each other, yes. would, it, would they blink like independently or? That's a really good question. So that's, this is one of the biggest potential weaknesses of using these as a random number generator. If you do have somebody, say an attacker who wants to know what your random entropy is, mm -hmm. they could put their detector close to yours. Uh, and in principle, perhaps measure some of the same rays. The, the vast majority of cosmic rays that are registered pass through to the detector. Somebody can maybe put one on top and see, measure the exact same thing. That's one of the things that's really important to test. I think that uh, there are ways to take uh, random entropy from these signals that will avoid that, but it, it's definitely something that's going to have to be tested. So I'm wondering if um, you had two of them, then you could you know, have two, di two digit number in memory. That or, right. So uh, if, say, uh, you, you could double your, your, your entropy. That way, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, could you maybe mix up the if the signals are random? Could you maybe mix them up with like a cryptographic hash? Just yeah, so each one unique. Yeah, that yeah, and that certainly might be a way to increase your overall entropy depending on what kind of hash function you choose. That's what uh, that's what Cloudflare does with their wall of lava lamps. They run that video through the hashing algorithm to get their randomness. Yeah, but I had someone mention the detector detector because. Joel mentioned this was part one, so it sounds like we got a part two, the <laughs> random number of generator detector to detector. So in six months, uh, do you want, do you want to take one more question? One more? Yeah. yeah, I was just going to ask if there's like a sensitivity aspect to that. Can, so will it just detect the smallest of cosmic rays or? Uh, yeah, there is actually a threshold. I haven't gotten too deep into that, but that's one of the things you have to play around with and set in the Arduino code that's on the inside. Yeah, it's a good question. All right, uh, I realize...